Hello, my name is Mark Taylor and welcome to the Education on Fire podcast. The place for creative and inspiring learning from around the world. Listen to teachers, parents and mentors share how they are supporting children to live their best authentic life and are proving to be a guiding light to us all. Hello, welcome back to the Education on Fire podcast, wherever you're listening around the world. If you're listening in the UK, I hope your transition back into school has been a very positive one in the last week or so. Today I'm going to be talking to Tanya McPherson-Smith, who founded Clear Minds Education in 2015. And the idea is to combat the rise in mental health issues in teenagers and children. She's created an educational program called Monkey Wisdom, which draws on her skills as a teacher, coach, storyteller and therapist to help children and adults alike to easily understand how and why children are developing emotional and mental health issues that can last a lifetime. Just before we get into this really important conversation, I'd like to thank NAEP, the National Association for Primary Education, for their continual support and sponsorship of the show. They're currently offering a free e-copy of their professional journal, Primary First. And to get a copy of that, you just need to go to their website, nape.org.uk forward slash journal, and it'll take you to the page where you can download everything that you need. So that's nape.org.uk forward slash journal. But now this is my conversation with Tana McPherson-Smith about her organisation, Clear Minds Education. Hi, Tana. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Education on Fire podcast. This is going to be a very insightful and important conversation. I, I know it's um, it's an area which is important and been very personal for, for us as a family. So I'm really excited to see where this takes us and, and how many people that we can help. So thank you very much for being here. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. So let's kind of rewind the clock a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your sort of professional background, because I know you were a teacher and all that before you started to, before you set up Clear Minds, and, and tell us sort of the sort of process of getting from that sort of A to B. Well, I was a teacher for 25 years in secondary schools, um, teaching drama, PHSE, uh, I was a senior leader, prep school governor, uh, and everything I did always was trying to find really creative ways to help children of all ages to come out of the shadows and find their light. To, so bringing children who perhaps one never even really knew in school and to find a way of bringing them out of the shadows so that they could be seen and know who they were and that other people would know who they were and it worked really powerfully and we did some very extraordinary events to help that to happen. Uh, In 2013 I had a a major breakdown, mental health breakdown, um, completely unexpectedly was taken into hospital for three days of assessment and didn't come out for six months. So it was a really big changing point, as you can imagine. Um, When I came out, I realised that I was still really not well enough to go back to such a demanding teaching role, working in a boarding school, running a boarding house. We had 60 13 to 18 year old girls living with us. And um, my commitment to them was such that I knew I wouldn't be able to do as I would want. So I made a very painful decision to leave um, the school that I love very passionately and my colleagues and so on. And I, I went to go away and work on myself. But when I was in hospital, I really started to notice because I talked to everybody and I, I love to talk to people and kind of get to the bottom of what's going on with them. And I started realising that with everybody I spoke to, whatever their background, whatever their reason for being in a psychiatric unit, there it went some way back to their childhood. And it wasn't that each and every one of them was abused or treated badly. Sometimes it was just in the very loveliest of families, just simple repeated behaviours that seemed to have created their lack of belief in themselves or the belief that they were worthless or they weren't good enough or whatever. And so um, as I started, I made a decision to really explore everything about myself and how I came to be the person that I am and how I came to be the person that would have such a, a massive breakdown and began to explore everything with um to look at psychology, to look at the way the mind works, about how we think about what the trends are, what the research is showing. And I started to talk to more and more young people and really found a pattern that to me made so much sense. And when I started developing a way of explaining it to other people, 
it just came to um, a program that kind of showed me that I needed to work through this with teachers and parents because if I'd known what I'd discovered when I was a parent if I'd known it as a child and if I'd known it as a teacher I would have done things very differently and so out of that came my company Clear Minds which I started in 2015 and I developed a program called Monkey Wisdom which is what I take to schools across the country and uh, as a speaker as a storyteller but also as a coach and therapist and Monkey Wisdom really is the basis of me doing everything that I can to change the face of mental health for children and teenagers going forward and ultimately therefore to impact the mental health of future adult generations and I feel that this is really essentially what I'm here to do uh, and will commit the rest of my life to, to doing what I can and the Monkey Wisdom program has essentially three principles of understanding communication and empowerment and it's about tackling the issue of the demise in mental health in young people from the grassroots up. It's not about sticking plasters over those that are already struggling, although I do have a program of coaching and therapy to release trauma and anger and grief and anxiety and all these emotions that we're seeing these days. But what I'm really doing is trying to tackle it from the very beginning to prevent it from ever starting by really helping parents, would-be parents, teenagers, teachers to understand the minute detail of how it starts in the first place. And once you understand that, it is so easy to make small changes that can really impact the mental health of the children that you're working with. Uh, I see that for me, nursery and primary schools have the most significant role in a child's life beyond that of the, the people who bring them up because those first seven years are so critical to all of this. And in understanding how the inner monkey works, and, and the way I explain it is that we're all born with our, an inner monkey that lives with us all the way through our lives and has a in, very important role in how we see our lives and how we approach things. Uh, and by helping parents and teachers to understand how the inner monkey develops the beliefs that it has and therefore how the child develops their own beliefs and how the monkey talks continuously throughout their lives to highlight the weaknesses that they perceive in their owner it makes it really clear as to what we are doing perhaps wrongly because we don't understand the impact of every single thing that we do or say or emotional response we have with our children every single day and essentially it's as simple as that and let, can we just explore that a little bit just to begin with because there'll be lots of people myself included suddenly thinking about all the things that you said and all the things that you do naturally like you say maybe not even thinking about it can you give us some sort of some key examples or, or things that we can even be aware of that could help us okay if I can just explain a little bit how the monkey works, if you imagine that every child is, I mean, every child is born not to be a, a bad child or a naughty child or an aggressive, angry child. They're, they're, we're born to be alive and to see joy in everything. So what is it, the question was, that changes that? Where a child increasingly, we're, we're seeing anxiety and anger at a very, very young age. Uh, and so if I, I describe it like this, that every child is a, is a tapestry. Um, to children, I have to explain these days what a tapestry is, <laughs> but I'll say that it's, you know, a picture that's made up. You're, you're a, a picture of a, a child made up of thousands of stitches of threads and the monkey has a big bag of crayons. And what the monkey does is with every single experience that a child has as they develop and they're going through life, the monkey will colour a thread according to the emotional response the child has that to experience to that experience. Uh, but we're all unaware of that, of what's happening. So what happens with the monkey is that um, a child, for example, a child who has been potty trained and is very excited that they're not wearing a nappy and there's a big family gathering and it wants to get it right and it gets the sign that it wants to go to the toilet and is pulling on people's you know, shirts and jumpers and trying to attract attention, but every, all, everyone's having a drink and enjoying themselves and they just don't pay him attention. And then he has an accident 
And then everybody's paying him attention. You know, why didn't you tell us? Why didn't you ask for the potty and so on? And so I'll say to children and adults alike, how do you think that would make the child feel? And kids generally say to me, not important, not noticed, um, very sad, upset. And I'll say, well, what colour do you think the monkey would colour the thread for that for that event? And they'll say they're all different. It might be black or grey or, or red for anger, whatever. So that child then is a, a four or five year old who is coming running out of school at the end of lunchtime. And they're usually really excited, full of excitement to, to meet the parent or whoever's picking them up and tell them about what's been going on. More often than not, parents, um, carers, all of us are very attached to our phones. And what I see all the time when I'm observing is that children are running out full of beans and excitement and the parent it says, hang on a minute, I just need to finish this text or I just need to finish this quick call. And by the time they finish that, the bubble of excitement has disappeared. So I ask again, you know, how might that child feel? Well, perhaps not important enough. Um, upset, the same thing. So it's coloured in the same colour as before. That's a child who maybe as a teenager sits at the front of the class and the teacher says, anyone got a question or anyone can answer this? They put their hand up. And, and this was me as, as a teenager put your hand up, wanting to take part. And the teacher goes, what, no one? All right, okay, moving on then. And they get ignored. So how would that feel? They are not important and so on. And how I explain it is that when you have enough of these tiny experiences, which as a child or a teenager or an adult, you're never going to remember individually. But when you have enough of them coloured the same, so you get a patch of red or black, that patch can develop into what we call a limiting belief, which for this child might fundamentally be, I'm not important enough to be noticed or I'm not important enough to be loved. And those limiting beliefs tend to start with, I'm not good enough to be loved. I'm not good enough to do well at school. I'm not good enough to get in the football team. Um, and so that's the starting point. And when you understand how each of our tiny behaviours can impact in such a big way, you start to realise that if we change our behaviours in small ways, we can actually make a massive difference. And the work that I do with children individually, it's, it's not magic, but the transformation can be so dramatic. And actually, all I'm really doing is paying them attention, one to one, eyeball to eyeball conversation. And that's one of the simplest changes parents can make is to commit to one or other, ideally both um, partners to spending 10 to 20 minutes, depending on how many children they have, with each child, eyeball to eyeball every single day, where that child knows that is their time. And whether it's just to read a book together, whether it's to have a cuddle, whether it's to go and explore the garden, if it's just having a real heart to heart, knowing that they're important enough for that can be transformational. And I I was having treatment with um, a, a, an osteopath a year ago and at the end of it it's the first time I'd seen them they said you know we have actually met before you you delivered a presentation a year ago and one thing that you said has transformed everything we have four children and I came and spoke to you about the difficulties we had in our relationships as a family and you told us about this eyeball to eyeball 10 minutes a day and we started it the next day and within three weeks the whole atmosphere in the family had changed and we've been doing it ever since and she said, I've just come from a 10 minute tea party with my eight year old. So it's just about making really simple changes. And if children, I, I have children as young as four who totally get the concept of the inner monkey. And then we teach them um, to understand that the monkey has conversations in their heads all the time based on its belief about the child. So if a child thinks they're not important or not good enough, the monkey will point out at every opportunity the evidence to prove that that belief is true. So they'll point out each time they're not picked to be in a team or each time they're not part of the, po the popular group uh, or each time the teacher's not noticed them. And it will keep, keep building that belief and making it bigger and bigger. So at such time when they come to their teenage years, those beliefs are really enhanced. And then they judge everything from the standpoint of that that basis that I'm not good enough. It's not something they're consciously aware of, but subconsciously the monkey drives everything. So what I teach teachers and parents 
to do is to work with the children to come to understand that they can actually take control of the monkeys, they can befriend them, they can ask them to turn the volume down so that they can't hear all the negative self-chat and they don't hear the conversation at night time that's keeping them awake. Um, and they can use them positively. I had a, a five-year-old who really struggled with reading. I gave her a, a wooden-headed finger puppet of a monkey. Very, very sensitive, delightful child. And she told me one day after we'd been working with it for a while, she said, I've been talking with my monkey and I get them to name them. I get them to find pictures of monkeys that resonate with them. And she said, I've been talking with my monkey and um, I've been asking it every day to help me with my reading. And she said, and it's got so much better. And when I spoke to her teacher, she said within three weeks, her reading had transformed. And it's just, it's such a simple tool. There are a couple of things which really strike me there. The first is something you said almost at the beginning of our conversation was about when you were a teacher, the essence of really speaking to the child um, individually and that's something which comes up time and time again on on the interviews that I do it's the you know what was it about a teacher that made such a big difference and it was it's not about they taught this subject brilliantly or <laughs> or we had that experience it's always about they saw me they knew me you know we had there was a relationship there which they couldn't put their finger on other than the fact that it was it was it was a, a sort of a, a two-way street of actually seeing each other. And, and and I love the fact that, you know, that's kind of where this conversation started because mm -hmm. it, it's already seemed to me that that's, that is such, a, such an important thing. Yeah. Um, and, and the second thing is, is the fact that the way that you explain it, hopefully that gives everybody so much faith that you can just change what you're doing now for what's happening in the future rather than the sense that something has happened, the way I was behaving, the fact I wasn't doing x or y has had a long-term effect but once you understand it and you do it differently and each child understands the fact of what's going on then it can change like you said within the space of three weeks and really quickly and, and that then i think has a much different perspective on, on the whole conversation of what we're talking about completely and um once kids of all ages learn and understand that premise that they have control over their thinking and they have control over their monkey then they it really does change things and that that's the other aspect is is we as teachers we we have things we have to achieve we have so many tick boxes there's so much paperwork and you've got to get them through x and y and z in your coursework and you have to get them to a certain grade because the expectations are x and y and z that it leaves little room for the real creativity and the real personal touch. Um, and it puts enormous pressure on teachers. But actually, if we can help children to understand that actually their thoughts create who they are and everything that happens, and that's quite a big one to swallow, is the fact that we do actually have a choice every minute of every day about how we respond to things because based on what we think. And if we change our thinking, we really can change everything. Um, I'm working with a girl at the moment who's 14. She's had an incredibly difficult background. Um, she's been out of education for months on end because she's been moved from pillar to post and there's no school that has taken her up yet. So she hasn't actually been in school since Christmas. And we were talking about, and you know, she's been quite grumpy in our meetings and so on. And we were talking about the fact that she gets very little sleep because her mind is always going back. She has flashbacks to things that have happened in the past. So I told her to suggest that she approach things very differently and that she literally said oh, as many times as she could think today, every time she went to the bathroom, every time she was brushing her teeth, every time she was eating food, that she would think, you know, when I go to bed tonight, I'm going to have the best night's sleep I've ever had. It's going to be the comfiest bed ever. And I'm going to wake up so full of energy in the morning. Um, and I said, I also wanted her to write on all the mirrors that, you know, I am good enough. Uh, and I spoke to her yesterday and she said, oh, God, I'm really sorry. I've completely forgot to write on the mirrors. But I did do the sleep thing. And she said, and you know how grumpy I am in the morning. She said, but actually, I've really shocked myself because every day I've woken up. And my first word is grumpy. And then I've just got out of bed and got going. And guess what? And then she suddenly, she told me, this is a girl who's had no motivation to do anything. And she suddenly said, I've looked up a, um, an organisation, a dance 
uh, organization so I can go and start getting back to my dance. And I've decided I'm going to start a company and I'm going to do X and Y and Z. And when I leave school, I'm going to train and take it up to another level. And I'm going to do. And suddenly there was this outpouring of seeing herself as somebody who could actually achieve and had a direction and a future. And it's literally come through the fact that she has seen in in a very short space of time the change that she can make in herself and that actually it's really worth doing that. And that's that's when it gets so rewarding. And in terms of being able to to share this with the world, you know, th- there's obviously this sort of one-on-one coaching which you're able to do for, for people that need it in that way. Mm. Um, how do your talks, how do your workshops work um, in terms of that sort of one-to-many, in terms of how, 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 I guess, how do you hope that everyone takes it on board while, while you're there? And, and, and it must be harder to, to get that feedback to know sort of how many people have really got it. I, I, I do do a lot of um, inset training for teachers and I may have, I've had, you know, sort of 200 in a, in a group. I'll do presentations to pupils. I've, I've had, you know, year groups of, or two year groups of 450 I use a lot of storytelling techniques and I, I always make my um, teaching, whether it's with, with parents or pupils or teachers, uh, very workshop based. So I make it very practical and I'm getting them up and actually physically getting them to, you know, perhaps grade where they are emotionally on a scale of one to ten. And then well, what if you're on a, a three because you're held back by fear, what one single thing could you do to, to move up to three and a half? And you break it down and that makes it really simple. Um, and so it's very interactive. I do talk about my own experiences, which I think makes it very real for other people to understand that I have been a teacher and I have been a parent and I've parented a lot of other people's kids. And I've also had mental health problems and I still do battle with them. But I know that this works and I get so much feedback from teachers and parents with the changes that have happened for them at home or in their classrooms and questions that come back which means I know that they've gone away and thought about things so I make it as as dynamic and hands-on as I possibly can um, and interactive and I always ask for people to come back to me and let me know what's going on and ask questions if they need to and one of the things that I'm I'm acutely aware of is the fact that even with all this experience, even with all this knowledge and and even expertise to really support people, there are some people who you can you can explain all of this, you can you can kind of be there for them in every possible way, but it's it's down to that individual to take take it on board or to accept it or want to move on a bit like you were saying about your previous story in terms of the difference between one day and another whether that's a combination of more sleep or more understanding or or whatever but th- there there is also that sense of the, a time and a place and each person's journey yes. getting to there so ha- how do you how do you approach that how do you deal with that I'm just thinking in terms of people who might feel like there is no way forward or or, or it's a very difficult situation just that sort of essence of there is a time factor and and a time and a place for each journey within the overall sort of conversation as it were I believe that completely we're all on our own path and we will will come to a point where we may or may not, we may be receptive to exploring things in a different way. And there may be some simple thing that triggers it off. It could be a book. It could be an experience. It could be a major experience like mine. Some of us will never get it because our personal makeup and our own experiences don't allow us that freedom to explore because we have shut down so much from what we've been through. Sometimes it's not even from our own experiences. It's what we've inherited from our parents, even from our grandparents. These issues can be passed down the line. Um, if you had great grandparents that are, were, you know, ve- had very depressed, had really difficult lives, it doesn't mean that you as third generation or something is going to be depressed, but you may have a greater propensity for that to to come out so there are some people who don't get it but all you can do is to is to to work with those who want to ask the questions and to change the thinking and the views of as many as we can and I think if we could get teaching into place much earlier on in schools about 
the way that we are and the reasons that w the way we are and how our behaviours impact our peers and impact children we might have in the future. And if we were to put this more emphatically into teacher training so that teachers really understood before they get in front of the class, the impact of their own behaviours, which will be driven by their own experiences. I mean, we all know of teachers that I, I call them radiators and drains. We all know of teachers that are radiators. You say that you would like to climb Everest and they'll say, wow, fantastic. Tell me how you're going to do that. And there'd be others that go, oh, really? You don't even, you know, you don't even put any effort into your sports lessons. So how do you think you're going to climb Everest and immediately shut people down? And that all comes from whatever is in our heart, what, what a, whatever story we have in the background. And I think one of the things we touched on earlier is is the, you know, the, the way the system is set up, you know, the whole pressure that's on teachers, on schools, and that the whole ability to be able to, you know, see every child as the most important thing and be able to adapt to the pressures and the situation that we're in. And, and while we may like a, a government to come along and say, do you know what, we're going to change the entire system. Um, <laughs> it's probably yes. not going to happen this year. No, no. <laughs> um, and, and, and that's that's why I love the, the, these conversations, to be able to share the fact that it doesn't matter because, you, you know, despite all of that, you as a teacher, you as a parent, you as a child listening can make that that difference now. And 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 it just break my heart that the system is such that we're doing the exact opposite that we would really yeah. like to be able to do in terms of creating that loving and, and supportive environment for people for children to grow and to explore and to do all those things that we talked about you know your natural propensity to be able to just thrive and to be full of joy because yeah. you're suddenly told you know sit still don't do this don't ask a question <laughs> you know don't don't feel like you can get something wrong all of that kind of thing um and and so it, you can see why it's affecting so many children from such a young age and that we're just making it worse and and I, and I love the fact that you're able to have this program and these conversations in order to just sort of debunk all of that and actually give people a sense of despite all of that we can still make a difference and we can make it from today i, I really believe that a hundred percent uh and the more conversations we have about these kinds of things and the more we understand how we really are governed by what we think and if children are taught that from a really early age then their ability to inspire themselves and to step out and and be braver and bolder and take risks would would automatically go with it but you know we have to tick a lot of boxes and i really feel for teachers now you know i stand on the sidelines now my husband has taught he's retiring this year but he's been teaching for 47 years uh, my daughter's now a teacher and I we have been talking obviously about what's going on at this time. I've been observing from the outside what's going on with the whole coronavirus situation and the impact that's having. But again, how we respond to that or how we face going back to school as teachers or as pupils, given the circumstances, depends really on our mindset and whether we choose to embrace it or we allow ourselves to continue in fear or to be angry or diffident or, you know, uh, whatever response we're currently feeling. But we do have a choice to change that. And, and I think you're right. And I think that the current situation is a really is a real magnifying glass for that. I mean, I just know from, you know, walking around the supermarket, you know, you see some people who are still prepared to smile and, and you know, say the time of day. And there are some people that do look at you as if you're about to take a knife out and attack them. You know, you you, know, you are a dangerous person if you get even within half a, an aisle of them. And, yeah. and, and, you, and you just sort of get the sense of, you know, we are in two different planets at that point. You know, one of someone can be really so fearful and other people, you know, despite maybe taking all the precautions and, and aware of the fact that, you know, we're in a, a global pandemic. But at the same time, your realities can be completely different, even in the same aisle of a supermarket. Yes, completely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the sadness is that now, now and, and I totally understand why we're all wearing masks, but with masks, we're now taking away the greatest form of communication which is facial expression and so actually knowing whether someone is smiling and and giving you the time of day it depends only on whether you're really looking at their eyes because you can't see anybody's faces anymore 
And that actually is is going to have a critical impact on the mental health of children in the future. If young children, if we are told at any point or if we have to become masked, because one of the issues with the development of children is that, and this is a real concern of mine, is that we as adults are so addicted to our mobile phones that, and I, I sit and people watch on, you know, King's Cross Station and airports and anywhere I can to observe behaviours. And more and more, whereas in the, the olden days, we used to push prams and we'd be leaning over and going coochie and making all these noises and faces and expressions. And the babies were learning to put expressions with tones and voices and then words. And that's how communication started. What's happening now is that babies are lying there and so often those who are caring for them at that moment are so busy texting or looking at things or on the phone that they're not making that facial communication and they're not the kids are not getting the stimulus and the learning tool that they so desperately need and I, it sounds like I'm criticizing all parents and so on I, I'm not at all because we're we all do this it's part of the way we are now that we're so in communication all the time but it's just pointing out the awareness that actually when you're doing that your child is really missing out on vital learning tool. And again, if we put masks over our faces with newborns and, and small children, we're taking away the very fundamental tool for their ability to learn empathy. And without empathy, we have real problems. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, th I think that the one positive, which I, I feel is, 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 is come across my mind quite a lot recently, is the fact that I kind of thought, you know, we were waiting for some kind of miracle to happen in order for the world to be different. Um, and while the current situation has been terrible in so many ways, it has shown that we can, as a species, change our entire life almost overnight, you know, when we think it's important. And, and while, you yeah. know, we would think that climate change is important and we should be doing something, or we think, you know, education is important and we should be doing it differently that hasn't been the case and it may or may not change <laughs> as we go further forward but we have shown that things can change immediately and e even the phone scenario you know if you think back you know a couple of decades then no one had iPhones or smartphones and so it was, it was different and it changed because of technology so quickly and I think just grabbing on to the fact that it can change good and bad really quickly and I think like I say once the message is out and once we can have these conversations to the point where we can make a vast amount of people aware of it then mm. hopefully that that speed can be be explained and i think we've had this this example which i think is a is a good way of being able to show that you know literally overnight things can be very very different yes and and obviously there are, are children with really serious issues um and and really ingrained mental health problems with de depression and self-loathing and you know deep-rooted anger or grief and I'm not taking away any of that um, but what I really believe is that there are different ways of tackling it and I, um, especially when there's such a shortage of um, support being available and people having to wait long times we these interventions can make a difference even we, I mean, I just as an example, I remember being handed a 17-year-old, a really articulate, very, very bright, very academic um, intellectual lad um, who was on the point of taking his life, very suicidal, parents in despair. And my own bugbear is that I'm not intellectual enough. I, that's been a childhood thing for me that's that's always gone through. So when I met this this lad, I was thinking, you know, he's never going to get this at all. And I was just really honest with him. I said, look, I'm, I come at this from a, probably a very different angle from you. I don't know what your circumstance is right now, but I'm just going to tell you a bit of my story and how I see it. And you can take it or leave it. And so I told him a bit about my history and then I explained about the monkey and showed how that, and he just turned around and he said, I never expected that. You've really given me something to think about. This is not a way I would have looked at it at all. Um, you're a bit weird, but I think it's okay. And I said, and I just got up and said, look, it's up to you what you do with that. You can choose to work with it or you 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 may feel it's not right for you. And I and I just I walked out and was stunned to have a, a phone call from his parent um, a couple of days later just saying he really wants to see you again. He wants to discuss this further. And he said to me, 
a few weeks later that our conversation was the most significant turning point for him in making a decision that actually maybe it was worth relooking at his his life and how he was going about it and whether he it was worth still being here basically i mean that's it's incredibly powerful isn't it and and i think i think one of the key factors often is the fact that when you talk about mental health it feels enormous it feels massive we talk about the pressures we feel we talk about social media we talk about so many things and it feels like that literally the weight of the world is on everybody Mm -hmm. and at that point how can you know teenagers and children feel like they can do anything about it i mean i mean it, it just i mean they're just completely bombarded with it plus all the the growing that they're doing and, and the changes of their brain and, and all of that all at the same time mm. and i think it, there, there is a point where you have to decide that you can you want it to be different if, if you're if you're really struggling and i think just what you said there was really really key in as much as at that point, a child knows I have the ability and I know what it is that I can do and it becomes doable. And, and all those things we you spoke about a few minutes ago in terms of you know writing things on the mirror or, or, or conversations that you have on, and all of that. But just that, that one moment of just deciding, ah, oh, right, now it's about me and I can do something about it. And then you can get all the support and, and, and you can go from there. But I, I think those turning points are, are incredibly, incredibly important. And I think for me, the key aspect is the fact that as a child or someone in the middle of that, I now understand I can do something about it. And, and it seems to me that you know this whole premise of the monkey just gives people that immediate knowledge and understanding, because I guess it, it's, I guess it's speaking to something that you know yourself, because you know, we all know intimately inside ourselves that these things are going on and then people don't talk about it and it's not been articulated so when you hear something which you know to be true even if you didn't you couldn't articulate it yourself then there's the kind of an awakening i guess at that point and it gives us it gives hope because otherwise you know we, we, kids are told well you're you're struggling with this and and you're really moody and you're not communicating and you're not this and you're not that and oh by the way you know you've got to achieve x and y and z but and you're not going to get an appointment with a doctor for or to see anybody for several months and there's a real aversion to being given to a counsellor and there are amazing counsellors and therapists out there and I'm not at all having a, a a conflict with anybody at all i'm just saying that for for a lot of kids because of what they say to each other the thought of seeing a counselor is no i'm not going to see a counselor and i'm not going to see a doctor i'm not going to be on drugs for the rest of my life i'm not going to see a counselor because it's not going to make any difference and i'm not going to tell them anything because they'll only go and tell other people so they have all this negativity within them and so that's exactly the point if there's something a step that they can take themselves and take back control it might be worth a punt and let's let's take this into into your school experience in terms mm-hmm. of what was valuable about it and i know that value comes both sides doesn't it It comes of understanding that something wasn't necessarily good as well as something being bad so so tell us a little bit about that and if there's any teachers that you remember my own schooling um i mean i i used to think that actually i you know i was i was really happy and so on but actually i i was incredibly lonely as a teenager because my my mum became quadriplegic um i think within the first year after my birth and then she died when i was seven and oh that was obviously a massive loss and in those days there was no the, the, the you didn't talk about things at all uh, and my brother and sister were sent away to boarding school so it was kind of like a triple bereavement so when i went to secondary school um I did find it very difficult to have belief in myself that I, you know, I had I had great friends, but I always felt I was on the outside looking in. Uh, school saved me in so many ways because I found that by helping other younger children, it gave me a sense of purpose. It gave me, yeah, something to do that was positive. But the, the teachers that really inspired me were, interestingly, um, my French teacher and I, I hated French. But she was my form tutor and she showed a real interest in me and did talk to me about what was going on and did encourage and try and find the light in me, I suppose. And my English and drama teacher, um, partly because my English teacher 
really sort of heralded and applauded my ability to write. And I didn't really have much faith in myself about anything at the time. So that made me feel really good about myself. But more importantly, she she introduced me to drama and I had no confidence whatsoever, but she still took me into uh, what was the West Kent Youth Theatre at that time as the youngest member and helped to bring me out of the shadows. And I I loved her always for that, for her inspiration, for her, her uh, company, for her willingness to take this rather shy individual and helped me to be part of an amazing organization and we used to tour and and do all sorts of things and I that was I've never forgotten them for that and we haven't got time now to talk about the arts generally speaking and why they should be an integral part of every child's life <laughs> in in, oh, in, yes. in school but I, I it just goes to demonstrate again you know the sense that we need a voice we need an outlet we need an ability to be ourselves and like you say if it's not oral if, if it's not a way of being able to articulate ourselves as ourselves growing up you know being mu- uh, musical being in a in an in a in a drama setting in a way that you can do it differently but it's in but share your voice it was certainly the case for me you know Mm -hmm. when I was as a musician I suddenly knew that playing this instrument was me talking to someone in a way I couldn't ever do it um sort of face to face in in that way and you know we, we you know we talk about environments and the way we can support children and I just think all of these things are things that could be a a a lot different and, and really support support every child as well as um Mm-hmm. Like I say, the other things that we've been speaking about as well. Um, what was the best piece of advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? I wouldn't say it's advice per se, but um, not long after I, well, I suppose maybe about two years after I'd come out of hospital, I was trying to get myself fit and really focus on getting myself really, really well. And so I started running and I, I've never run terribly well, to be fair. But I was running one morning um about nine o'clock in the morning in the drizzle, drizzling rain. And I passed a, an elderly gentleman carrying two very heavy uh, supermarket shopping bags. And for some reason, I ran on a few paces and stopped and then ran back and said, can I help you with the bags? They look really heavy. And he went, no, 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 honestly, I live literally just in these flats in this block right here. But for some reason, we just I just started talking to him. Um, he had a very serious skin affliction. He, um, We started talking about what we'd achieved in our lives and whether I asked him whether we had any regrets and he said yes you know he wished he'd had family and so on and I don't know why but I was being far more honest than I would normally be with a stranger and I was talking about the fact that we'd never had any money and money was always an issue and and so on and so forth and I think we ended up talking for about an hour in the rain and eventually I said you know I really ought to let you get into your house and it's been so lovely to talk to you and he said before you go can I just say something and I said yeah of course what and he said did you know that you're a millionaire And I went, oh, that's a bit odd, given what we've just talked about. Um, I said, I'd never quite seen myself as a millionaire because money's always been a bit of a struggle. He said, no, I'm not saying that. I'm talking about you being a millionaire of life. What do you mean? He said, well, the way you've talked about the relationship with your family, with your son and daughter and your husband and your extended family, the way you talk about your relationship with other people, he said, you truly are a millionaire of life. And with that, he turned and just disappeared. And it really had it had such an impact that I actually looked for him for two years because one of the things he'd said was I really would just love to have someone to go and have a cup of, cup of coffee with. And I wanted to take him and do that. And it took me two years before I was driving past the supermarket and I suddenly thought I recognised that figure. And I turned around and I went in and I ran in and I tucked him on the shoulder. And I said, I don't know if you remember me, but two years ago, We stopped and talked in the rain and you told me I I was a millionaire of life. And I said that changed everything for me. It changed the perspective on how I looked at what was of value to me. Um, And we had a cup of coffee. That is such an amazing story. And I, 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 I do occasionally just have to have a have a word with myself when when I speak to people because sometimes you feel like you should say the right thing or the wrong thing or it you ought to make you more you ought to suggest something or you ought to just and the 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 answer is always be yourself and do what your intuition tells you is the right thing to do um 
and that just demonstrates it in terms of you stopping in terms of the conversation that you had the the advice that he gave all all of those things together and i think when there's that kind of honesty and that kind of authenticity of of whatever the situation is then it can only ever be a a, a really important thing i think so i mean and and i do i do actually stop and talk to a lot of people now because i learn something from every conversation that i have with someone else that you know i might just pass at a bus stop um i hope nobody thinks i'm too weird but we do end up always having really good conversations yeah, and i think people <laughs> generally want to chat don't they they, they, they want yeah. to, they, we're social beings and i think that i think that's a it's such a great starting point for everything that we do <laughs> um what advice would you give your younger self and i guess we have to have a given that we wouldn't just be talking about the monkey and, and all the things that we've covered so far um oh i wished i i could have believed in myself and trusted that the the that my approach to other people was actually absolutely okay I wish I I would have said to myself that you really can change how you think um and by putting myself down all the time I was holding myself back I was holding myself down almost like being tethered underwater and that if I had actually really thought about strengths and the person that I was and believed that I could be somebody actually that I could be anything that I chose to be then I think life would have been very different but had I done that then I wouldn't have learned what I've learned now and I really believe that all the things that I've been through have been so critical to me being the person that I am now and I wouldn't have changed anything and I think that's an important factor that all of our experiences, everything that we experience and enjoy or not going through life takes us somewhere and has a message and a gift in lots of different ways. Mm. And so I think having that, no matter what the circumstances are, can give you so much strength and understanding and, and, and an important an important starting point for however you want to have that next conversation with yourself. And, and I think it's, it's a really key factor. Mm. So just to finish off, let's talk about a resource that's had the biggest impact on your life. And, and it can be anything from a podcast, a book, a video, film, song, but something which has had a big impact and, on your life. And, and why was that? Actually, interesting. Well, there's 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 a book and a, and a film, really, I suppose. The book was, again, a bit of a turning point for me. Was It's called The Dalai Lama's Cat by David Mitchie. Uh, I'd never heard of it. Uh, I was allowed out of hospital to go down to the station and just have a look at the Smith's bookshop. And this book was sitting totally out of context, just this one single book on the bookshelf. And it just jumped out at me. I thought, this is really weird. It didn't fit in with anything. I'd never seen it before. And I just, there was something that made me take it and read it. And I absolutely devoured it. And I've passed it on to several people. And basically, it was about how to find happiness and meaning in a busy materialistic world. And it was written from the perspective of the Dalai Lama's cat overhearing all the conversations that he'd had with all sorts of people from all walks of life, from presidents to um, monks and, and just ordinary, ordinary mortals. And I just was completely inspired by it. And interestingly, I've never seen it on a bookshelf ever since. But it, it remains in my heart. And the other is really, I suppose, is the film Inside Out, and I was already thinking about the book that I'm writing now. I'd already planned it in a way. And the, uh, and, uh, the, and it's really about inspiring and helping children, teenagers to see themselves differently. And I was so thrilled to see it last um, an animation in a sense that I thought would really touch and connect with young with children of all ages that was really beginning to explore what goes on in our minds and how we're structured and what makes us tick um, so I was I was very jealous of it being out but I was absolutely delighted at the same time and, and just thought this is a real step in the right direction yeah I couldn't agree more I, I love that film and we went to watch it as a family and it really was something that sparked um, great conversation and insight and it was yeah it's, it's an amazing film please do check that out if you haven't haven't seen it so Tana thank you so much for your time and it's been I think an interesting but an incredibly important conversation and, and opened up so many thoughts and, and questions um 
in this whole area of, of mental health and uh, but I think importantly in just the way that we live our lives both as children but also as adults as well and I think that's the key thing that it's it's part of everything that we do so can you tell us exactly where we can go and find out more about you so that we can get as much information and get involved in any way that supports everybody? Absolutely. I mean, it's through Clear Minds Education um, and that's clearminds.org and all my details are on there. And if, if anyone has questions or is interested or uh, wants to understand more about the way that I work, then do just get in touch. I, I love to exchange ideas and um, explore things and you know I want to to get this work out to as many schools parents children of all ages as I possibly can and see if we can make the difference fantastic thank you so much for spending time with us here today and um, and I look forward to chatting again soon which I'm sure we're definitely going to be able to do thank you it's been a pleasure thank you thanks for listening to the education on fire podcast for more information of each episode and to get in touch go to educationonfire.com Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire.